Hi everyone, welcome to Erasing Shame through Honest Talk for Healthy Living. My name is Eunice Lee and I am one of the season one co-hosts with DJ Chuang. And I'm here today to talk about a special series that we're doing called Scene. Scene is talking about the impact of being a minority as Asian Americans. We're going to be talk talking about topics as wide as uh, the minority experience, Hollywood representation, to even as personal as anxiety and postpartum depression. So to kick off our series, um, I'm here with author of the new book, The Minority Experience, Adrian Pei. Hi, Adrian. Hey, thanks, Eunice. It's really good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Um, so just to introduce you, Adrian is the organ organizational development consultant, certified coach and leadership trainer who works with who's worked with two of the largest corporations and ministry organizations in the world. He specializes in speaking and writing about organizational leadership, diversity and inclusion. Um, he served as the associate national director of the leadership development of Epic Movement, the Asian American Ministry of Crew. He speaks at conferences, churches, universities, and podcasts. Um, Adrian studied at Stanford and Fuller Theological Seminary, and you can interact with him on Twitter at, at Adrian Pei. His new book, The Minority Experience, is available on Amazon and minoritybook.com. So thanks so much for being here today, Adrian. Really yeah, appreciate it. Oh, no, it's a, it's a privilege to be here and to get to talk to somebody who you're doing such great work with the series, and I think shame is such an important topic. Yeah. So I appreciate it. Yeah, I feel like this book was really timely. Like it came out, launched along with Crazy Rich Asians and this whole mm -hmm. representational Hollywood thing. And I was mm -hmm. just thinking about this the other day, how in a way, because I know that this was a long process to get mm -hmm. this book published, it was almost like mm -hmm. you were ahead of your time in this because you were thinking about these topics way before this was out in the media and this is kind of out in the open. Oh, thanks. I mean, he gave me too much credit. I don't know. I mean, I didn't anticipate the crazy rich Asians would come out. <laughs> I think it's been a long time coming for a lot of us, right? To see that many Asian Americans on the screen and to have some of our own stories and, you know, even the inside jokes and, and cultural issues kind of on the big screen. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that, um, I think it was timely, um, but kind of in the process of writing the book, I did discover that, man, there are themes that have got, been going on for years, even before. Mm -hmm. So maybe there is kind of more of a timelessness to some of these things. And it just happened. It just feels like it's timely, but maybe kind of these are some themes that have happened for many years. And so um, I hope to see more uh, great things like Crazy Rich Asians and other, other kind of minority uh, voices and being heard. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and kind of speaking of minority voices, I mean, what your book did, I think that it was wonderfully written. And it was a kind of a mix of your own narrative, look, looking at it in the larger scope, and then your own experience of being in a large majority culture white ministry, which is Campus Crusade or Crew. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought it was just, it did a really great job at creating language, or maybe yeah. just giving language to the experience of being Asian American. Um, and it was, I mean, as I read it too, I got, it was like, you gave words to this visceral feeling that I felt and, um, of just knowing that I'm not alone in, in this kind of shame of feeling other all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about your book and, and what it's about. Oh, thanks. Yeah. And yeah, you're right. It really started from my own experience, you know, and, and you're, I think you're right. You put, you hit the nail on the head that the book is really about putting words to feelings that I've had, that uh, many of others have had, uh, you know, that idea of feeling alone, like you said, or kind of inv even invisible in a room full of people uh, wanting to, are we other, do we need to change ourselves to fit into whether it's the organization or society? And those are the things that the emotional realities of pain in some ways that I experienced myself. But, at, and so it really started off re really for me to be thinking about my own experiences and kind of almost my own journal but then I found as I continued to write that many other minorities seemed to feel those things too, and that there were similar themes that appeared throughout the history books and autobiographies of minorities across centuries, continents, you know, and I thought maybe there's something else going on here. So uh, I came up with this framework of how the minority experience can be understood in three categories, pain, power, and the past. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's kind of how I tried to kind of put some categories and words to some experiences we've had. And I, and I do think that, you know, like sometimes when people think of, you know, my, what it means to be a mi minority, the first thing to think of is numbers, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, you're one among many people, and so you're a minority. Uh, but I think that when we listen to painful realities of people and see the gaps of power and 
we understand kind of how history has impacted current events, we begin to really understand on a deeper level mm-hmm. what it means to be a minority. So I do think that there is kind of uh, a deeper level that we can go to. Yeah, definitely. I write about that in the book. I really like that idea of how minority isn't just about numbers, because I think that you're part of the Asian American organization of Campus Crusade. So there are times when you'd be in a room full of mostly Asian Americans, right? And mm-hmm. we kind of crossed paths there because I was on staff with, with Epic right. for a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but then there's still this power differential when it comes to the majority culture people in the room. Yes. I mean, that was one of the breakthroughs. And I think I learned this from my majority culture coworkers, you know, who, you know, a lot of them kind of came to Epic to serve and kind of even have the humility to uh, be on teams led by Asian Americans, which really was a great way of doing it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes they would say how, you know, they could be the only white person in the room, and yet they would be the majority in terms of the power they held, the way that people looked to them, the kind of privilege and access they had, uh, the kind of things they didn't have to think about compared to a lot of us who we might be vastly outnumbering them, mm-hmm. but we didn't, we still had, we had to struggle with additional layers of challenge um, and, and doubt, self-doubt and, you know, assimilating, feeling the need to assimilate, or that feeling of shame that we talked about, some of those things that they don't think about at all. So yeah. I think that it, that was really a light bulb where it was like, wow, you know, it's not really about numbers. It's really about other dimensions that go a lot deeper than that. Sure. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, you mentioned also in your book, you talk a lot about the past mm-hmm. um, and kind of our, our collective story and also our individual stories. Um, and that really got me thinking, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on this, because I know that for a lot of immigrants, um, like like my parents' generation, um, mm-hmm. and then like my, my in-laws who are refugees, right, mm-hmm. they don't really talk about their past. They kind of leave it behind. And I'm wondering if that does a disservice to the minority experience, too, is that they don't get that um, congruent um, story of what it means to have your own past be a part of you. Yeah, that's a great point. And uh you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, even with my own family, you know, I think that sometimes you talk about shame, right? It's like, sometimes we feel like, I think a lot of times maybe we ourselves feel, but our parents and our grandparents, they don't necessarily share about their past because it's very painful, uh, whether they're, you know, some for them, it's immigrants, some it's refugees and, and some, there's really painful and, and difficult memories that they have about leaving their home country, maybe when they didn't want to leave their home country or, you know, coming over and feeling like they were uh, bullied or discriminated against. And you know, some of my own relatives, you know, were prevented from owning land because of the Chinese Exclusion Act. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's a lot of realities that happened there. And then I think for a lot of them, they just don't, they choose not to talk about it for that reason. But I think that the more that they do share those things, I think it really opens up the door to understanding. And I think that in my own family, I know that I kind of would just keep asking my parents to share their stories. Uh, like my grandma um, on my mother's side, you know, so my, my mother grew up in Vietnam, you know, um, kind of right before the Vietnam War. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so her parents sent her over to, uh, the, the, their kids over to the United States, like one by one. Um, and then, so she, she came over when she was pretty young, but then some of her siblings were left behind and, uh, or just didn't come over as soon. And then her own mother had a situation where when the war was happening, there was like a bomb that, dropped in her backyard and actually it didn't go off fortunately but that's like how real it was for them you know and so the more I kind of asked my parents to share the stories they it was really enlightening to help me understand you know like you know I think sometimes for them because they came from so much pain and they wanted so much to fit in that they they kind of that really formed the way they looked at the interact interacted in America in terms of like just not wanting to rock the boat too much you know um wanting to find a way to fit in. And so I think that sometimes those past experiences they had impact even the way that they interact in society. Mm-hmm. So, and it's different for Im- immigrants, refugees, I'm sure, so. Yeah, yeah. And, and you address it in your book too, but I'm sure that creates a message that they send on to their kids of, mm-hmm. if you're just good enough, then, you know, this mm-hmm. pain won't be transmitted to you. That's a great point. Yeah, I think you're right. And that sense of, yeah, like, it, you know, kind of maybe it's sometimes easier, you know, hey, just try to make it in this country, you know, I, we just want you to be happy, which is nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, I think for me, as I started to uncover some of the pain, 
you know, and, and then kind of being able to understand like my place in society and what I can offer that's different from people. Like that's not comfortable, you know, and that's not something where I'm just fitting in. It's something of like being able to like, you know, point out injustice, point out pain, point out power gaps. Mm -hmm. Those are things that, you know, is not comfortable for a lot of people to think about. It's not just fitting in, you know what I mean? And so I think doing that has really been harder to do, but I think, you know, as my parents are also have been on that journey as well. And I think they have been very glad to see kind of uh, this journey and we've kind of been on it together. And so when they saw the book come out, they were very supportive and and very proud. So, yeah, that's great. I I think that I've, maybe your experience is different. I feel like that's rare to have your parents also walk on that journey with you. I feel like um, a lot of parents are just very set and this is how the world works and it's very progressive your parents to, to want to share that journey with you. Yeah, much credit to them. They, they've really been their, their lifetime, lifetime, lifelong learners and so I really appreciate them yeah, mm-hmm. for everything they've done and who they are. Yeah. Um, so... Can you share a little bit about what really stood out to me was the chapter on domestication. Hmm. Can you share a little bit about what that's about? Yeah. So, you know, the book is structured such that it talks about pain, power in the past again, and it talks about it in the context of these emotional experiences that minorities go through. So the first chapter is on self doubt. The second chapter is on domestication. And the third one is on weariness. Mm-hmm. And they all talk about different uh, experiences that minorities have that kind of wear them down. Because I think that very often conversations about race diversity are about like, they go in the direction of like overt racism or discrimination. Mm-hmm. But so often there's these forces that are kind of deep uh, under the surface more that really wear on minorities, even if there is not that overt racism, discrimination. Mm-hmm. And one of them is domestication. And this the whole idea is that very often we struggle, like I start each chapter with kind of a, a heart question, like an internal question. So the, the question on that one is, can I really be myself? Can I really be who I am and be accepted for who I am? Mm-hmm. And I ask that question throughout the whole chapter. And what I realized looking at my own journey was that, uh, you know, kind of growing up in a situation where, again, I tried to fit in, you know, mm-hmm. very often I would try to imitate the majority culture yeah. or just not try to rock the boat by pointing out differences or, you know, injustices when that actually uh and so i and i realized kind of like why did i do that why do i try to fit in you know and very when i studied history i started to see examples of um events that happened that uh it wasn't just accidental but there actually were conforming pressures by things like i tell the story of walter little moon and a lakota native american whose people were really um you know kind of really intentionally put through these boarding schools to strip them of their of their uh, culture, their their customs, their language, and so to really and 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 that was really it reminded me of this idea of domestication, um, not that humans are animals, but really this idea of treating humans as sub subhuman, mm-hmm. and it was really hard to see. And then I saw it with other groups like the Japanese internment camps and whatnot, and just seeing how like very often we tr- uh, there's forces that that really try to shape. Uh, minorities into the image of the dominant culture. Mm-hmm. And even if those things were 50 years ago, like it has an impact to today with the negative messaging and the, and the stereotyping and kind of the, the messages that are passed from generation to generation yeah. to the point where I realized that, wow, you know, some of these things have had an impact on me mm-hmm. and then my, co- my colleagues and my friends. And yeah. so we feel it's not accidental that we feel the sense of like uh, needing to be different, but good to mm-hmm. be better. But I think often we kind of look at it and go like, we think that it's, if we don't, we're not in touch with that. We don't understand kind of those pressures and the history. We may think that it's our, we're the issue. We're the problem. Yeah. And so we kind of turn that blame upon ourselves and it becomes a shame. And I, I, I shouldn't be who I am. Mm-hmm. And so I think that that's what that chapter is really about. It's kind of unpacking the historical forces that put pressure on minorities to try to fit in. Mm-hmm. Um, even if something as simple as like literally going out with your friends when you're, when you're young and trying to like, Try, trying to fit in and just try to listen to their music and do what they say and not under, and for me not understanding kind of the roots of that why that was happening yeah I, I feel like for me that that concept really opened the door and kind of married what we do here at Erasing Shame mm-hmm. with the larger kind of justice movement out there because mm-hmm. um my understanding just from, like was that oh we have shame because our parents put shame on us to mm-hmm. to this this I met this woman um, who was telling me like our parents focus so much on who we need to be 
and they mm-hmm. forget who we are. And so there's that little house of it, right? But then what you're sharing about that domestication, domestication process is like, oh, this is also kind of in touch with reality, in touch with how we're impacted in a systemic way. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not just that, oh, we have shame because we're Asian, but mm-hmm. this is really the minority experience that every culture experiences. Um, and it just looks this way to us. Um, right. So that really clicked for, for us in our house. Like, oh, that's, mm. that's the, the connection. So your book oh. was kind of the key there. Oh, that's, that's really cool. I love, I love that uh, insight you brought up. Yeah. Yeah, and, and there's that, you know, there's this quote that I, I quote somebody in, this, in my book that somebody said, you know, again, if you hear over and over again that you're inferior or good for nothing, you may eventually start to believe it about yourself. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's so many stories that I saw, whether it was uh, Walter Littlemoon, but even like an African-American uh, from a book called The Warmth of Other Sons that talked about how, you know, he was continually turned down uh, from going to these motel rooms, you know, and basically told you, you're not okay because the inherent message is because you're black. Mm-hmm. And then he basically started to really doubt himself. He's like, is it something that I didn't say? You know, he, kind of, he rehearsed over and over again the speech he would say to the motel owner to try to get in. Mm-hmm. So he kind of internalized that blame mm-hmm. you know, as opposed to realizing, you know, these are systemic forces that have been happening for years. And it's, it's a really, it's a, there's a lot of forces that are at play that kind of mm-hmm. do, do make that happen. So, yeah, I think that's kind of, I, I did see it throughout the, across the different minority groups. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it, I mean, I think that that's such a good point that there is something that can internally cause us to feel, you know, we use the, in, in this podcast, we use the def, Brene Brown's definition of hmm. shame is something that you, you know, that you are, but guilt is something that you feel. And then hmm. there's this perpetuation of shame. Um, how do you think that the minor experience um, perpetuates shame in people of color? So, like I kind of said, you know, there's that messaging that's been communicated to minorities that we're unworthy. Mm-hmm. And so that, and that could be like through the media, racist remarks, like there's the whole, um, Michael Luo did the, this is 2016 social media campaign mm-hmm. that kind of captured a lot of um, overt racism that still exists towards Asian Americans. Yeah, I mentioned there's the impact from historical events, whether it's, you know, it hasn't been that long since the civil rights movement, the Vietnam War, those kinds of things. Still, there are painful realities for Native Americans and immigrants from Central America. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that w- 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 the way I see it is that where minorities have been historically unsuccessful or unable to fight back against these injustices that have happened, mm-hmm. they sometimes turn the blame on themselves. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's the shame. It's, the, it's one of the saddest realities, I think, of the minority experience is that you know, there's these beautiful people who have been mistreated and they feel like, mm-hmm. I'm the problem. Mm-hmm. But they're the problem. And so sometimes they try to change themselves or even take their own lives. And, mm-hmm. um, and so, th- yeah, the first chapter of my book actually centers on this idea of self-doubt yeah. and how minorities kind of internalize the blame in situations, even when it's not their fault. Mm-hmm. And they begin to wonder, am I the problem here? Yeah. Would it just be easier if I went away? And so for me in that chapter, I actually share about um, my own experience going through a new employee training in the majority white uh, organization and environment. And some examples were uh, my wife and I felt silenced when we tried to share our perspectives and mm-hmm. our struggle to fit in socially with our peers when we were different in many ways. And I was shocked at how much that experience kind of wore me down and how it triggered these feelings of insecurity, paranoia, depression. And so I think that to me, I think that's kind of how the minority experience perpetuates that shame. The idea of just really, the, sometimes the blame is coming from forces outside of us, but we when we can't fight back or we feel like we're unable to, or we, we, we internalize the blame, we say maybe we're the problem. Yeah. Yeah. And I really liked in that example that you, you and your wife spoke up and, and, you know, did something about it, which is not what um, a lot of minorities, a lot of Asian Americans would do. They would just kind of accept it and internalize it and then move on. Um, so I think that's, I think that was different. I feel like that was different even the way that you were able to approach it later on well, that was my that was jenny that was my wife she she did, <laughs> she did that more she was she was the brave one i think for me i just i think i was more didn't know what to do mm-hmm. and i think it was later on 10 years later that i circled back to um the difficult experiences i had with uh, the leaders there to really uh, unpack it more um mm-hmm. and even talk about the process of writing this book and so that was healing for me but i think mm-hmm. she was she was the brave one not me yeah 
<laughs> well, I wanted to give you some credit, but I remember. Oh, thanks. That. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, I think that's, inc- I mean, I remember even being in seminary and people would say like, oh, you don't, you identify as Asian American, but you don't seem like it. And mm. oh, it was wow. that, that kind of like, you're one of us, but it was like, well, what do you think of Asian Americans then? If I seem oh. like normal to you. So there's these yeah. little things that kind of show up even in our everyday interactions with majority culture that can sometimes, even though it seems complimentary, feel very, wow. very strange, right? Do you, do you get insight into what they meant when they were asking you, you seem different or whatever that way, the phrase, the way they phrased it or? You know, I didn't. And it was probably my own, you know, my own journey to domestication that I just said, oh, thank you. Or and a, a friend of mine who's reading your book also said the same thing about a coworker who said, you seem really white. And mm-hmm. it was supposed to be a compliment. Oh, wow. And, you know, it's like, what do you do about those situations where, oh, where you have to explain yeah. a long history? And um, yeah. sometimes it's just easier to dismiss those. those uh, little, wow. That's a great point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but I, I love that. And I mean, honestly, now I feel like I can give them your book and say, oh. <laughs> this is the reason why you don't, you shouldn't say that. Um, mm. But it's, you know, it's hard. Um, yeah. And I'm wondering for you, you know, you've been, been on these book tours, you've been on podcasts, you've been on ra- the radio, just talking about your book. Um, what stories have you heard from, you know, majority culture and uh, minorities about kind of, I'm sure that they're sharing freely with you. Yeah, it's been, it's been really amazing. Um, I, I, one of the things I've heard is definitely, I'm encouraged to hear that people from different uh, fields of work and life have found connection to it. So, you know, uh, I know people who have bought you know, a lot of copies for the church staff and for a digital strategies team. And then one of the interesting ones was uh, someone bought a number of copies for their fellow teachers to mm-hmm. kind of foster conversations about uh, how we teach kids about history and minorities. So that was good. Um, let's see, I've had some people had the idea to develop a training out of the book. Another person said it should be made into a play or a movie, but I think that was more of a joke. I think they may have been thinking the mi- Minority Report than Minority Experience. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, I heard a lot of people say they cried when reading the book. Um, one colleague wrote me and said, it's so good to know that somebody understood me and what I've been through. Mm-hmm. And I think at first, it, you know, it's very humbling to hear that, but I think it's, I'm grateful because I'm like, you know what? It reminds me that, you know, we do have, common struggles, you know, and that people are identifying with it in a very personal way. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the majority culture leaders who have read it, they've been very grateful. They said there's some, it's given them some eyes to see things they hadn't seen before. And honestly, I've been blown away by the humility of the white readers who have read it and leaders and crew and other groups that have said, I want to learn and understand. And so Mm -hmm. that's been very amazing to me. Um, I think minorities, it's been, more personal. They really felt like, hey, they identify with it. It's like almost like this is, this is, it, this is kind of part of my story too. Mm-hmm. Uh, they said it's been healing for them. They felt validated, known, seen, those kinds of things. It really is very moving. I had this, and I had this uh, conversation with a friend recently who was sharing about a childhood experience. It's bringing back these memories for people. And he shared how he was with some white friends uh, just trying to fit in. And he went along as they kind of mistreated another minority. And he was just tearing up as he, he said, um, man, I, I so wish I could take back what I did. And I was just, um, he told me that the book really helped him to process kind of those experiences. And I don't know, it was just one of those moments where I was just, I was in, in tears as well. And just, you know, thank God that, you know, um, we can talk about these things. And, you know, my hope is that it would open up the door to dialogue and that uh, people would share their own stories from it. So that's kind of what I've been hearing. Yeah, I mean, that's great. I think that, it helps um, people process what their experience was when it felt really alone. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's great to hear. Um, yeah. Even in our own, you know, in our own house, as we talk about, you know, crazy rich Asians, your book, all these mm. things that are coming out I've mm-hmm. noticed that there's this theme of, and you kind of mentioned in your book launch, your, your dad was this uh, mm-hmm. model of what it means to be a strong man, strong Asian American man. Mm-hmm. Um, and mm-hmm. we've been thinking about that. Mm. in terms of, you know, we have a son and mm. what it look like, looks like to model things like gentleness mm. and things like integrity. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm wondering if you could share a little bit more. You dedicated this book to your dad. Mm. And if you could share a little bit more about that modeling of what it means to be mm. like a strong man. Oh, thanks. for. I really appreciate you asking that question. I'm so glad you did because, you know, it really this I dedicated to him and he, I was thinking about him throughout the whole book. As I was writing it, um, he's been going through a lot of health challenges, as you may know. And so 
Uh, yeah, and it was really, you know, when the book came out, I was just praying that it would come out at a time where he would still be around, that I could, you know, read it to him and have him uh, be honored by it and, you know, and feel like he, that is a dedication to him. And, 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 and so I write, there's a chapter where I do share about some of his, his experiences growing up as well. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you're right. It's like, you know, I think that for me, a big part, when you talk about domestication and shame, a lot of it for me is kind of like my, my story of kind of saying, is it okay to be who I am as an Asian American man? Because I see so many examples that make fun of Asian Americans in the movies or whatever, you know, I mean, I'm so crazy rich Asians. And it's mm-hmm. funny, I actually did write about Constance Wu in, in my book. Yeah. Um, one of the chapters and kind of what the journey that she was on and the struggles to kind of get representation. Mm-hmm. But um, I think that I always saw such, you know, negative examples and then kind of made me question kind of like, is it okay to be, you know, my bone structure, my height, you know, like the way I look, you know, the way society looks at me. And, you know, I think for me, it was a journey of like coming to understand that, you know what, like I am beautiful the way, I, the, the way that I am, the way that God made me too. And I th- think that my dad I think I I started to see him differently too in terms of realizing wow he's been this way that's so different from the way other people are in terms of you know he will really listen and he'll really be reflective and take time he's not the person to kind of dominate or assertive and you know and that doesn't mean that assertive is bad but he's just able to really create space for people uh, lead with freedom gentleness all those things Mm-hmm. And I think that he might be someone who might have gotten left behind, you know, overlooked in a, in a, in a, a white leadership selection process or discussion, you know, but I look at him as a role model in that way. And um, actually the way that I, I got one of the best compliments that I got for the book was that, you know, in the book, I write about a lot of things that are very difficult, right. You know, some really painful uh, realities. And I think even as I read it, I was like, wow, I, I want to find that line between being respectful and yet being truthful. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that's hard to do, and I'm just praying that that it's it comes across that way. Um, I think so far I've heard that uh, you know people are receiving it decently, so I, I really want them to know that this is truth. I want to share the truth, but in a way that's also respectful. Mm-hmm. And I think that what I've heard, one person told me that they said that the book is very truthful, but he said that it's also very gentle. Mm-hmm. And when I heard that, I was like, yeah, that's my dad right there. I was like, that is, that is Tim right there. It's the fact that, you know, I got whatever gentleness that people perceive from the book, that there is that sense of like, not shaming everybody or trying to, you know, you know, whatever it may be, but just really kind of gently communicating truth. That's my dad. That's what he, he does. That's what, that's what he's done for me. And so I've learned that from him. And I think that I've learned that from him and from being Asian American as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it creates this, that, that minority experience creates that empathy that we need in the world which is, yes. which is so great. Um, mm-hmm. And not to give anything away, but I love the last line of your book. I won't give it away, but <laughs> I remember just reading and putting down and be like, wow, that was, oh. I won't, oh, won't thank see you. what it is though. It's a cliffhanger for the next book. No, just kidding. <laughs> 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 no, yeah. But no, I, I really appreciate that. And, and you know, I, I, I think that um, I really wanted to write about um, not just the Asian American experience, but other minority stories as well in the book um, because I feel like there's so much power that we can have when our voices are together um, than they would be alone. I mean, I don't speak for other races or I know there's differences between groups and everything. So I'm not saying that that is, um, you know, that it's all the same, but I think there's a lot of power that we have when we work together. And I think that, and when I read Walter Littleman's story, you know, I wept, you know, and I know that I have many Latin, Latino, Latina friends and African American friends who have, said they identified very strongly with the book to the point where it was telling their story too. So I feel like there are bonds that tie us together. And I just hope that we have the open communication, you know, among people, uh, among minority groups as well. Um, So that's just, yeah, one reason I wrote it too. Yeah. I I think this was a tricky book to write because you didn't, you encapsulated your own experience, but not one story of being a minority. And yet in the way that you did it, so many, minorities could resonate with what you were sharing um which is hard it's hard to not encapsulate all in one story your story is the only story kind of thing yeah i know and i really did that that's one reason why i told so many stories in the book and i referenced so many other books so like i wanted the book to be a kind of a reference as well if somebody wanted to just pick up a book and kind of like i reference a lot of my colleagues have written amazing things and as well as history books like stories that are not as well known among people 
And so basically my hope was that, you know, when you tell a lot of stories that it's not just your story, right? You're connecting a lot of people. And, to, and, and I think that sometimes when we historically as minorities have not had as much uh, platform or voice, it yeah. can feel like, oh, my story was not represented. And I totally get that. I think you're always going to get people who um, wish that there were more representation of other groups. And that's, I think, because of that shortage and lack that we've had. Mm -hmm. There have not been enough stories, period. And I think that's a very fair uh, reaction anytime somebody sees a movie, like Crazy Rich Asians. They may look at it and say, well, it's only certain Asians, not others. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, that's totally understandable because there hasn't been enough. There needs to be more. That's mm -hmm. a very legitimate reaction. And I think we need to just keep doing more and more. And so my hope is just put a whole bunch out there and let's have more people share more and more. And I think that um, that will be powerful the more that we can catalyze more of that to happen. So um, mm -hmm. I really wanted it to be, yeah, this is not just about me. This is about... Uh, amazing people, leaders throughout history, amazing colleagues right now who are doing great work. Um, and I just, <laughs> I felt like I'm just like, I'm more synthesizing things. You know, it's not like I'm, you know, I feel like I'm synthesizing what I've learned in the process of somebody who's kind of been growing a lot and learning a lot throughout the years. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that that's so important too that you added the other populations of color as a collective voice because I think sometimes as Asian Americans, sometimes we can kind of be in our own bubble and mm. so to reach out to other stories, too, is to say, hey, we're all here together, experiencing this together, which I think was so great. Yeah. You know, in, in a book I read about this, um, 1903, there was this, in history, there was this uh, joint labor association and strike that took place bet uh, between the Japanese-American and Mexican-American workers. Mm. And after the strike, the American Federation of Labor tried to split the groups by offering to charter the association under Mexican leadership with the condition that the Japanese and Chinese workers would not be granted membership. Hmm. But the leader of the Mexican uh, workers, J.M. Lazarus, refused the offer because it would leave out the other minorities. Hmm. And I think that when we've been fighting so long for a voice and societal power, it's really tempting to take that offer. You know what I mean? It kind of, but they refused to marginalize other minorities. And I think that was a really wow. powerful example to share their platform and voice with other minorities, say, you know what, this may take a longer path for us. It may take more pain but mm -hmm. we are in it with you mm -hmm. and we're not going to compete against you. We're not going to turn against you. The reality is that we are, we are on the margins and we need our voices to be unified and we need to come together and we have great strength together. Mm -hmm. So that's an example that I see as inspirational and yeah. I see it happening more and more. That's great. Yeah. I love that story. Um, so the last question I have for you um, is, you know, in the beginning of the book, you outlined being at that new employee training and, mm -hmm. um, feeling silenced by your instructor as well as not acknowledged by your fellow students, the peers. And um, I'm wondering if you and Jenny could go back, looking back at that story, what would you now as you're older and you've written this book and everything and experienced all these, what would you and Jenny say to your younger selves and what advice or empowering words would you give them? Hmm. I think, I think I would have, I guess I would have listened to them. Um, first and kind of giving them a hug and <laughs> encourage them mostly, which is what people did for us, which is great. Mm -hmm. I think I would have told them um, that pain is a vital part of the journey and the minority experience, uh, that I would be there for them as they walk through the pain. I would have probably prayed with them, uh, pray that God would strengthen them, make them more pa compassionate people through it all. Because, you know, one thing I talk about in the book is that pain, you know, really God can turn that into compassion. Um, mm -hmm. We can see people who have been in pain. Uh, I might also encourage them with a reminder that cross-cultural experiences and minority pain are often not as personal as they often feel. Mm -hmm. I think we often feel the weight of decades of negative messaging like we talked about and these conforming pressures. Mm -hmm. And again, we internalize that blame in the form of shame, but it's not necessarily about one teacher or one racist remark or even one organization that's the source of what's going on. And as, as I've come to see that, it's really helped me accept kind of the journey, my path that I'm on and how God can use it for good. Mm -hmm. um, and like 10 years, I think I mentioned this, I hinted at this, but 10 years after, I read about the book in chapter one, 10 years after that bad, uh, difficult experience with a teacher, I reached out to discuss our experience. And mm -hmm. he told me that he hoped our dialogue, which is in, in the book, would help many people. And so I guess I would conclude by telling a younger version of ourselves or myself that, you know, don't be too hard on yourself. Um, it's a long journey. Even 10 years later, it's not too late to circle back and face the unresolved pain that we have. Yeah. And there might be an ex unexpected gift that's uh, waiting, waiting for you on the other side. Mm -hmm. I'd probably say something like that. Mm -hmm. That's great. I really like that. 
Um, yeah, I'm so glad that you were, I'm, and just so impressed that you were able to go back and talk to your instructor and kind of, there must have been some difficult conversations writing this book because it was going to go out into the public and things like that. Yeah, it was hard. I won't, I won't, I won't sugarcoat that. Uh, it did take me 10 years, so <laughs> it's not like I was that, uh, you know, it, it, it was a, it wasn't like I had that much courage, but I think that I did do it and uh, it was so worth it uh, mm -hmm. just to kind of, you know, I think in some ways, uh, what I learned through that experience and in general is that when we really communicate truth and reality, mm -hmm. you know, it can be painful, but people ultimately do appreciate it. And so I think he wanted to know what our experience was and I wanted to know what his experience was. And mm -hmm. we wanted, and, and just talking honestly about how we felt and, and, and what we've learned since that time. And, you know, it's been 10 years. And so he's been on a journey of learning and I've been on a journey of learning and we're in different places now. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, he said, you know, he even said to me, he says, you know, like, um, you know, like there are things that I would have done differently now, mm -hmm. you know, and then he said that, you know, don't be too hard on yourself and you feel like you could have done things differently because that's where you were at, at the time. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and you know, it's a long journey, as I said, and I think that, uh, mm -hmm. it often could feel so hard when we're in the middle of it, but there's, there's, um, uh, it can come, it can move in many different directions. Yeah. So, and for, for good. Yeah. Well, I think my biggest takeaway kind of from reading your book is, that there is this gift of um, the minor experience, which is empathy, and then also the ability to see power, which mm -hmm. is important in my line of work as a therapist, because mm -hmm. if I don't see power, then how am I supposed to see family systems and how am I supposed to yeah. identify that weariness? Wow. Um, mm -hmm. So I've been recommending this to a lot of my therapist friends who are majority mm -hmm. culture, who are white, mm -hmm. who are curious about how to work with mm -hmm. um, minority clients because I think that they think they know um, mm. but what they don't recognize is sometimes that um, say if I went to a someone who doesn't understand power as a client mm. I might instead of being vulnerable try to please them and so then there's oh, wow. a bigger that power gap and yeah. so what I've been trying to do is to educate my peers is to to share this information with them and to say you know that there is um, that if your your Asian clients seem to be getting better sometimes they're just performing better Wow, that's a great point. I love that. Yeah. Uh, that's that's really insightful. I love the way that you're, you're thinking about that. That's really neat. Yeah. Uh, that's a, that's a, a, a different level that you're, th you're having them think about that uh, than what, yeah, it's like, it's like, it's almost like you have to see below the surface of just like what you see uh, externally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you may, you may there be more under that. And I think, I thought, I think about that sometimes with even um, with Epic, you know, uh, our work with Epic, because so much of what we did was create space for uh, staff and people to kind of like, uh, you know, start that journey of discovery of who they are. But mm -hmm. in that process, it's almost like if you're successful in doing that, it may not always look successful in the beginning mm -hmm. because people are like, when they have that space they haven't had for years, like mm -hmm. all these things come out, right? Like anger, you know, sadness, you know, all, all these mm -hmm. things come out. And so it may feel like, wow, what did I just do by opening this thing up? You know what I mean? But mm -hmm. in reality, you're actually, they're making progress because they're processing, they're healing. Mm -hmm. And then they can come to a place of being who they are and being and and and, and still learning how to interact uh, well with society. Yeah. When in reality, as you said, kind of like if people just learn how to perform and fit a certain model, it look it may look like it's going fine, but in reality, none of that stuff is. They're not really being who they fully could who could be, or they're not healing or processing all the things that would really help move them towards greater health. So I love what you're talking about there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and that kind of brings me. Um, to the resources that you wanted to share, because the first one is Asian American Christian Counseling Center. Um, and I'm one, I was wondering if you could share kind of all the resources that you, you'd want to share. Sure, yes. And I, you know, I think you and other listeners may be familiar, but really uh, Asian American Christian Counseling Services is a great group, you know, talking about mental health and shame. And uh, I know a lot of people there are very good people and they're doing great work. And so I think it's a great resource uh, to uh, help uh, people who uh, are looking for um, that, that um, people who understand them and their cultural journey and some of those challenges that we talked about. Um, there's another organization called Asian Americans Advancing Justice, which is kind of uh, more of an advocacy uh, kind of organization. So it's not as much mental health, but it does cover the systemic areas of mm -hmm. kind of injustice. And I think they do great work. And so this is a Los Angeles group as well. Uh, so those are a couple of places I think are very helpful. Um, and then I mentioned, you know, of course, you know, I, I would want people to know about uh, the book, you know, at 
which you can get minoritybook.com and Amazon, and really look at the notes and the appendix for the list of the books that I referenced because there's so many great things that people have done there that um, I think that it could be uh, just, I wanted to list all the work that my colleagues have done and that uh, other people have done, you know, in the areas of race and identity there. So uh, mm-hmm. ho- hopefully that will be a helpful starting point for people as they lo- want to see what else people have written and what's out there. Yes, definitely check out the book, The Minority Experience, not The Minority Report. That's what comes up first <laughs> on, on Amazon, <laughs> Amazon when I put it in. But yeah, The Minority Experience, such a good book. Um, like you said, it's a great starting point, a place for people to start to give language to the systemic um, the systemic racism that that brings about shame um, in our identities as Asian Americans and minorities. And then also really great to educate um, anyone who's in a helping profession needs to read this. I feel like anyone who's a pastor or minister or therapist or counselor, social worker needs to read this because they have to understand that these dynamics are just not within the person, but that are systemic. So Mm. thank you so much, Adrian, for, for coming on our special, um, seen erasing shame podcast and we really appreciate that you could come thank you so much for having me it was so fun to talk to you and a really good discussion you're doing some really good work and i really hope that this series is uh just gets heard by a lot of people because it's such an important topic about shame so thank you for doing that yeah thanks adrian thank you for listening to this episode of erasing shame please subscribe on itunes or youtube and like us on facebook Share this podcast with someone you care about. For all of our episodes and more, visit our website at erasingshame.com.